Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Apparel Academy. Uh, on this episode today, we have a special guest, Jennifer Moore. I'll give a quick intro to Jennifer, uh, and uh, we're very excited to have her here. So Jennifer runs a full-time uh, YouTube channel out of her home in Tampa, Florida. She actually made the, tr the transition from being a news reporter on CNN to now running a full-time YouTube channel called The Sewing Report, which has over 22,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, her initial area of expertise was in sewing, but recently she got into embroidery with a single needle embroidery machine. So we wanted to invite her to our show today and talk a little bit about her experience, how she got into this space uh, with DIY and crafts and things like that. So very excited to have her on board. Uh, hi, Jennifer, welcome to our podcast. Hi, Henry. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Awesome, awesome. And uh, I, I kind of gave a quick intro there, but I think what most people in our audience are wondering is, you know, uh, tra transitioning from being a news reporter <laughs> from CNN, how did you kind of come about to run a YouTube channel full time with arts and crafts and, and DIY and now with uh, venturing into embroidery as well? So tell us a little bit about that and give a quick intro uh, on that end. Yeah, it's it's been kind of a wacky ride. I originally worked in television news for about 15 years. And during that time, I really didn't start sewing until kind of the tail end of that. Okay. So I started working at CNN and uh, I was a I was a producer, so I was never on air. But, um, uh, you know, I know a lot of people kind of think like uh, I know some of the jobs <laughs> at news stations yeah. are a little hard to decipher. So I worked as an assignment editor and as a producer in local in local news and then at CNN. And when I moved to Atlanta, I really wanted a hobby. I never really, you know, I didn't really have like a thing outside of work that I can that I could do and en enjoy, you know, besides, and I wanted it to be besides like, you know, television binging, because that's not really a hobby per se. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So so I thought maybe I would try sewing. So I bought a vintage sewing machine, didn't touch it for six months. My husband had to show me how to use it, which is, <laughs> which is a little strange. So I started doing it and I really loved I really enjoyed it and I was, uh, for context, I was not really like a crafty type. So a lot of people I run into, especially the younger crowd, they don't think sewing is for them. They don't think sewing, quilting, right. embroidery is for them. Um, so I get a lot of people saying, you know, Jen, I think what you do is great, but my grandma sewed, I could never do that. And mm. I think that attitude is such, it's so saddening because I yeah. think most people could learn how to do it. I mean, when you think about it, your grandmother started in the same position as you did when you were, new, you know, when they were new, they didn't know anything. So I think if it's possible for your mom or your grandmother, it's certainly possible for you in 2019. I've, I've heard that uh, saying before as well, when 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 we talk about, oh, hey, we manufacture so sewing machines and embroidery machines, and people are just like, oh, people still do that? Uh, that's kind of like, yeah, the, like general, yeah. the general reaction. It's like, oh, people still people still sew. And so um, the kind of per perception, I guess, from the from the public is that, oh, that's not something that, that people do anymore. But uh, in reality, like like you mentioned, it's it's quite a um, you know big uh, market for that, and people uh, actually do it as a hobby, and, you Know, and 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 have made very successful careers out of doing that. So um, we definitely try to kind of educate the younger generation a as well to uh, kind of bring them more into our world and to get them interested in sewing and, and embroidery. So it's definitely you know what you're doing on your channel definitely uh, helps that cause. And that's why I was excited to connect with you guys because I saw you have a, a pretty young staff overall, and mm -hmm. I think that's something that I think the more we put that out there, the more people see other people like them doing it maybe we can help turn the tide because I still do think sewing, quilting, embroidery does tend to skew a, a little bit to a more mature audience. Yep. And I don't see any reason why someone in their teens, 20s and 30s couldn't start doing it. And that's partly why I started the channel is because I didn't really see a lot of people I could relate to that was already out there in like the blogging world or the vlogging world. Um, yeah. A lot of, a lot of, you know, there are a lot of women who do it. Um, but I didn't see a lot of people with like a nine to five job who did it as well. And in fact, um, when I would talk to people in my like professional circles, I think I may have only encountered one to two other people who knew anything about sewing or quilting. So I still right. do think there's a very untapped market out there for working professionals and young, younger people, both men and women. 
Right, and, and definitely, I think there's a there's a channel on on YouTube like Man Sewing or something that. Just, oh yeah. I mean, he he just I mean he just goes all out with sewing and embroidery and 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 kind of you know teaches you on on the different tech um, you know on from a from a technical aspect and also from you know how to do these different projects. It's just very nice to see, and I think um, I I completely agree with you that I think uh, a broader audience can be exposed to this, and I think from the angle that that we take here in our company, um, we we try to kind of uh, uh, coupled this with with fashion, right? Because we're kind of in the intersection between fashion and technology, right? Uh, being able to manufacture these type of products to help people achieve um, their 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 uh, creative vibe and and also to be able to make a profit. Yeah, I'm actually kind of curious because I do see a lot of people doing home embroidery businesses, and I'm wondering, like, do you feel like the market for that is expanding as far as people wanting embroidery services? Yeah, and, and I and I think uh, I think someone asked me that on one of our live AMAs, and it's I think it's uh, definitely a trend that's uh, going to continue to grow because as um, as the kind of uh, your dispose uh, as the as the economy gets better and 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 the disposable income of people um, they they have more dispo disposable income to to spend, um, they're looking to for more personalized goods, right? And with that personalization, there comes the demand for for um, you know personalized garments like your embroidery on. Caps on on T-shirts, on uh, bags and jackets, and things like that. So um, I, I definitely think you know uh, you venturing into em embroidery uh, with kind of a single needle sewing and embroidery combo is the right step to to do that. And I'm, and I'm glad that you kind of taken that leap um, from just doing sewing or quilting and then expanding into embroidery because I think decorating apparel um, is something that we oh, yes. are, are obviously a big big um, advocate for, and I think it's a demand that's going to continue to grow. Yeah, for sure. And I think embroidery machines are, they're the type of machine that you can get into even if you don't have any sewing experience. Right. So I think actually they might be good for beginners because the machine really does all the work. So if you buy one, you don't really have to really know a lot of basic, you, you just need to know how to like thread the needle and change out the bobbin, but right. you don't need to have extensive sewing experience to get started. And I would say I, when I bought the embroidery machine, I, I was on the fence about it for quite a long time, but then when I saw when I saw that the, there was a new model out, I was like, you know, I kind of want to try this. It has a lot of really great features to it, like the LCD touch screen. So I ended up buying it, kind of. But I was like, kind of again, like I wasn't like, yes, I'm going to use this all the time. And I now I end up using it constantly. So it's nice. one of those sewing room workhorses that you don't know you need until you have it and then when you have it you realize there's so much you can do with it what prompted you in the in the you know when you first started looking into embroidery what what prompted that uh, that motivation or you know the, the the need for embroidery it was it was actually a kind of a weird story my husband needed uh, work shirts with his company okay. logo embroidered on them uh -huh. and I was looking online to see how much it would cost to buy to buy shirts and have them already done and it was several hundred dollars oh, wow. so I thought to myself you know I could spend several hundred dollars on some shirts and we're gonna need to buy them again or maybe we could just buy the machine and then we could get any shirts we want and then have the logo digitized and then embroider anything we want so we ended up going that route and I started out just kind of embroidering his logo onto his work shirts that are required for his job and then I just kind of went from there and I, I had had a sewing embroidery combo machine before, but I think having an embroidery only machine works a lot better um, okay. because you're not having to change things out from your regular machine. So I prefer unitaskers in the sewing room. I don't want to have like a combo serger and cover stitch machine. I want ones, I want separate ones because I'm kind of a lazy sewist. So I mm -hmm. really hate, I hate switching out units or modules. I, that's like the worst to me. Gotcha. So I don't want to do that. So the embroider machine is just standalone. And I think the one thing, the one frustration I have about it that I think machines like yours offer is the multi, the multi needles. Right. Because <laughs> it is, it is still kind of a pain to change out the thread every time. Or if you're doing freestanding lace to change out the bobbin every time. So yeah. that is something that can be a little bit, a little bit frustrating. Okay. But I think that's, but and again, I think maybe down the line, you know, a, a multi needle embroider machine would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that's the pain point that a lot of uh, single needle embroidery machine users uh, com come across, which is, yeah, having to, uh, when I do a multicolor design for a customer or something, and it's like, even if it's only three or four uh, different colors, I have to change out thread three or four times to, to, to do that, right? And so um, that's when they kind of realize that pain is like, hey, you know what, if I get enough volume to justify this, 
might as well in make the investment into a multi-needle machine and make it more efficient. Oh yes. So uh, yeah, I can definitely see the benefit to having a, a multi-needle machine. So, mm. but you know, I'm starting off small. I, th I think I think I've, I'm trying to master the one I have, and it's yeah. it's been a lot of fun to try out though. And also, the amount of designs you can get are endless. I've actually just hired people on Etsy to digitize the logos, yeah. but for me that works out because I'm not doing a ton of them. I've only had to do like maybe five. So I'd rather pay $50 for someone to do it than pay $1,000 right now for, for, software. for me to yeah to buy software and then try to figure it out. We also see that you have uh, other cha other channels, uh, other brands on YouTube. Tell us a little bit more more about that besides the kind of sewing report that you that you mainly focus on. Yes, uh, we have a few channels. I it's one of those things too because it's hard to figure out should I start a new channel or should I stick with the one I have. But my interests for some of the other channels are just so different than sewing. Mm -hmm. I didn't really feel like they would really fall under the same category. So I have one where I kind of talk about TV producer stuff or insights on the media, or I've, and I've interviewed a lot of people from the business. Uh, I have a channel called XTV Producer for that. And then I, I started kind of a random blog channel called Gen Talks Forever. And then I help my, hus I help my husband uh, with his channel, More Approved. And he's done everything from gardening to woodworking to fishing and cooking. So it's it's a lot of fun though. What, what I've seen from doing YouTube for the last uh, several months is just the the, the audience and the, com and the community of people that you're, that you're able to gather with a similar interest. And, and people, um, we've, we've heard from people that like they got introduced to our brand simply because of watching a YouTube video on some random topic on, on, on embroidery. That the, and, and it kind of, I think our mission here is to really open up the doors and, and be able to um, expose in, embroidery to more people, right? Uh, and get them to know about our world. And I think um, definitely your efforts on on, uh, on your channel um, definitely uh, go, goes alongside that. And, and I think um, that's the that's the ultimate mission that we have here, to, to get this to more people, to know about embroidery, or at least plant the seed so that they know that this is something that people are still doing and not something that people no longer do, right? Yeah, I wonder how people think they get embroidered shirts. Like, do they yeah. have... I, <laughs> You know, you, like, you see embroidery every, literally everywhere. Anytime yeah. you see a company item or something branded, it, it's, always, it's usually always embroidered or screen printed. Right. Um, but I think you're right though, the YouTube community is really an amazing place to be. And I think it's, I still think for video, I think YouTube is still the top platform if you do any type of video content creation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's certainly the number one searchable, definitely the number one searchable video platform. So I think it's an awesome place to be. And I, I do think, I think it's smart of your company to do that because if you're a business, I think you absolutely should be on YouTube. Definitely, and I think most people, uh, it, maybe you know, small business owners are are, are afraid of video, right? They, they mm -hmm. feel that, uh, oh, you need all this equipment and, and all this setup, but really it's just like, you just need to go out there and, and get, yeah. get on your phone and you can shoot a quick video as long as you're providing the you know, valuable content that people wanna, wanna listen to or watch, um, then, you, then you can gather that audience. And, and it's funny that, that you mentioned that, um, you know, where, where, where do people think the embroidered shirts come from? And it's, 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 something that, it's something that I don't think, unless you're kind of exposed to the space, you don't really think about. And, and that's something uh, that's true of, uh, from, from, from myself as well. Before I kind of got into this industry, I never really thought about, like it wasn't a conscious thought of like, oh yeah, um, these embroidered shirts and caps are done by machines that are actually, you know, um, that, that are made to, 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 to get this done. So, so unless you're exposed to that, people don't really think that people kind of take it for granted that it's just something they that really appears, do. you know? So, um, but what, after being exposed to this industry, then you're like, oh, wow, actually people do this for, for a living and it's a very, you know, profitable industry and, and people search things all the time on how to do these things, right? How, how to, how to make these DIY projects, how to, um, do like in the hoop embroidery from from scratch. Um, how to do like freestanding lace, as you mentioned before. How to do embroidery on certain items. So I think the the definitely the need is there. It's just about getting the word out there and exposing them to this to this area to this field. You know, just now with all this mass production, I think people just don't understand where their food comes from or how things mm. actually get made. So when there is a disconnect, like it's really hard to connect person to person because you don't think of an embroidered shirt as being made by a person. You kind of think it's some like far away process where it's made in a factory, but there are no humans involved, but that's not really the yeah. case with embroidery. Right. You do have to have a human manning the machine. So there's a, a real human factor 
And I think the more people learn about how things are made, I, I am hopeful because I do see more younger people taking an interest in that sort of thing. Uh -huh. So maybe we can maybe we can get somewhere with 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 the handmade movement and also people just understanding yeah. how things are really made. People wanting to uh, get started in this, they, they need somewhere to 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 go to. to they need answers. And so uh, we want to be there to provide those answers and to help them along the way. And, and I think that void is being filled by uh, you know pe uh, people like you who are you know getting getting out there, getting the, the how-to videos and, and the guides to show one what's possible. Right? What's what's actually possible in, in in that space, and then two, the actual steps on how to get it done. So um, I kind of wanted to, to to take this uh, opportunity to kind of segment into that and and talk a little bit about the DIY projects that you've done, and and maybe I don't know if you have some some things to to, to show us. I but, do actually. Um, also, yeah, also, yeah. I wanted to see a few projects and and kind of like what were the in, the inspiration behind those things. Okay, so. I'm, I'm working on a project. I recently did some projects. I've been making a lot of freestanding butterflies lately. So these were awesome. actually made with the with the machine I have, the single needle, and then I used uh, this really cool metallic and opal thread. So okay. I've been making a lot of butterflies, and I'm actually working on my next DIY project. So I'm making new butterflies. But what I want to do, and I think this is something, especially with the freestanding lace. Um, I'm planning on making a ton of butterflies, and then mm -hmm. you're the first person I'm showing this to. I, okay. I'm basically, gonna, I basically, I'm basically gonna revamp these shoes. So that's my next project. Oh, wow. Okay. Are are you gonna use them as as like as like different patches? Basically, they're gonna be 3D, and I'm going to hand sew them to the shoes, and then I wanna oh, wow. I wanna okay. bling out the shoes with a lot of rhinestone crystals. So I wanna take a basic pair, and these shoes are woven fabric. So I'll be so like I'll be able to you know to hand sew because there's you know there's actual kind of fabric to hold on to unlike a pair of like leather pumps or something. So the plan is to just make some really kind of smaller butterflies and place them on various areas of the shoes and really turn this kind of into a 3D like I don't I don't know like oh, butterfly nice. monstrosity. And then I think I think some of the stripe parts I'm going to do with rhinestone crystals. I may order some more and maybe do some colors. Uh, but I just saw these okay. shoes and I thought it would be a fun project. I've also done the, I've also made these butterflies and hand sewed them to a tote bag recently. I've done, uh, I think a really easy project that is great for gifts is um, often there are sales at Target where you can get really cute bath towel sets. So I will get those, pre-wash them, and then I'll embroider either a monogram or a design on it. And those are really great, really quick gifts. So I think that's uh, yeah. one thing is as far as the gifting, uh, again, I didn't have to sew the towels. I just had to buy them. And then it doesn't take, it doesn't really take very long to do a monogram on them and it, or, or some sort of design. So I've got a few towels in the works as well, but it's one of those nice. things where I've just been, I've been finding so many things. I made a dress shirt for my stepfather for uh, Father's Day and I monogrammed the shirt pocket before I sewed it together. So that, it's okay. a great way to personalize things you're sewing already. Or if you wanna buy pre-made items, like if you, you know, I could put something on this t-shirt if I wanted to. Um, but, but I think embroidery machines, the great thing about them is that you can either sew something yourself and personalize them, or you can take an item if you don't sew and you can just make it better. So I think that's the cool yeah. thing about the embroidery machines is that you can literally take any item, you can fit into the hoop and into the machine. And, and I think that's something that young people appreciate is they want things that are unique to them or special to them. And that's a really mm -hmm. good way to, to do an item. And that's a really good way to take something store-bought and make it something something that no one else has. Yeah, the, the couple of things that, that you mentioned with, with the towels, I know that those are great uh, gift sets for, for weddings. Oh, yes. Uh, people, yeah, people, people do that all the time and they, you know, they, they monogram their, their name on there. Um, uh, give them to a couple for for their for their special day. Um, the and and the and the shoes. The, I think there's a huge trend right now with like fl with like floral shoes, right? Anything with like bright colors and 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 uh, people uh, like adding these add-ons onto onto just like 
regular looking shoes. And then um, that is actually kind of, I think all these type of decorative things, it's just more value add to the piece of apparel that you already have, right? So um, it, can, it can make great gifts, it can make uh, you know people turn them for, for a profit, and it's just like really cool to see that um, the, the the trend is there. And even in like mass retail, um, for or like mass mass fashion, like with, with Zara and, and H&M, like you see jeans all the time with, with flowers, like with flower patches on them, or, or denim jackets with like all these patches. So um, people definitely kind of appreciate that trend and 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 uh, the, I, it's always good that when I when I go to those stores and I and I see that I was like hey, it's like a reinforcement that uh, embroidery is, is still very much alive and, and, and growing very much and even in ready to wear I was looking at some websites the other day I don't buy a lot of clothes to be honest with you but I, I look for inspiration and I saw tons of embroidered tops so that still seems to be very popular this this summer and and I have a question for you. Offhand, what's like the craziest mm. embroidery item you've ever seen? Like, do you have any like fun stories? So yeah, the the I think the craziest uh, project that I've seen or the craziest embroidery that I've seen is, is uh, probably on toilet paper. Oh my! That's how do you embroider toilet most, paper? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I personally haven't haven't done it, but I have a lot of customers that um, do this as either like a gag. Oh uh, my gag gosh. Gift. Right, but uh, but uh, they can also use it on uh, like as a as a piece of um, uh, decoration in, in in their bathroom. They'll stack up like several uh, rolls of, to of toilet paper, and then they'll have like funny sayings on them. I think we actually have like an episode on that, like how to how to embroider on toilet paper or something like that. But that's um, crazy. That's, that's something that. Yeah, I know, and and that's something that like I I didn't even know that that was possible. It was actually one of our 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 customers. Um, she was like, oh yeah, I've been bordered on on toilet paper. I was like, how how do you do that? And then she kind of gave like a step by step guide, and I was like, you know what? We should do this for our channel and actually show people how how, how to do this. What yeah. what kind of stabilizer did she use? Stabilizer? What was? Yeah, no, I, I she she did have to use stabilizer. I forgot what it was off the top of my head, but it was it was uh it's it's. It's uh, you, you might think it's very hard. Yeah, you like, definitely. Oh, toilet paper, so it's so, so so flimsy, right? How do you how do you hold all those all those stitching in there? But yeah, I think with the right stabilizer, um, you can definitely have uh, you know very complex designs embroidered on toilet paper and use that as like a gag gift or oh just like people place that around their house to to decorate their their bathroom and make it like their person with their personality in there and it's like a nice nice thing uh, to 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 see and people. Um, sell those gag gifts on Etsy oh, that's or hilarious. for like you know ten twenty dollars. So you just turn like a roll of uh, of toilet paper that's not worth anything to something that people want to buy with funny sayings on them and decorate them all around. Was your she house. using like the super high quality toilet paper, like the? <laughs> yeah, I think it has to be like the really nice like, stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, the two ply. Yeah. It can't be. It can't be like yeah. It can't be like the single ply and it's all like you know with a little bit of water yeah. in it. And, and it's, then it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, very, it's it's already dissolved. Yeah, it just like it just like break, breaks apart. Yeah, it has to be oh, you know the, the with like a good good um, quality to toilet paper, but then also have the right backing on there to, oh, st to stabilize the design. And it's only on the uh, first uh, first layer. The, yeah, anyways, the first. So you kind of roll it back up so it kind of looks like it's on the roll. That's exactly that is hysterical. Exactly. Like, that wow yeah. I didn't even know you could do that I'm excited though because I the more I have this machine the more I'm just coming up with new ideas like especially since I got these butterfly the butterfly software I've just been I, I keep thinking of more things I could put it on and I would yeah. I would also love to see more freestanding lace designs because I think that's um, something I don't see a ton of uh, but I would love to see more like, you know, like little creatures or like cool 3D things because you could really put yeah. that on a lot of stuff or you could take like, someone was asking me to comment, could I take a t-shirt or a top and sew those all over? And there's no reason you couldn't or you could take a jean jacket or anything that has mm -hmm. a little bit more structure on it and you could really turn it into a one of a kind piece of artwork. I'm constantly looking for new things and also yesterday I was talking to a guy and he was, uh, he had literally just ordered like a hundred hats with his logo embroidered on them. So we were talking about that okay. as well because he didn't really know much about it, but he was interested and I could, he's like, oh, so you could do embroider. I was like, I was like, hold on a second. I could do like one hat at a time. <laughs> it would take like, you know, like two years to get a hundred hats done. So you might not want to hit me up for that because I'm just so slow. But, and that's the kind of thing you would need to go to someone with a machine like, like Rakoma's is because they can right. just do them a lot faster. Right, right. I think the the it's there's a difference between like personalization and mm -hmm. and 
kind of like making things. Yeah, and like evolve, a production. Right? Yeah, so, and like full scale production. Right, right. But like, yeah, personalization I think is much more small, small batches, and and mm. and people like these cr creative things that might take longer. Um, so there are people that focus uh, solely on that. Even even in, in in the embroidery world, right? Even from our clients, that focus solely on these kind of like one-off mm. orders. And there are those that are kind of like a factory that's just like, oh, if you need uh, a thousand shirts, yeah. yeah, I can pump them out for you in like in like a week. Like I might go so crazy like, if um, I tried to do a thousand shirts on on the single needle. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, we have a customer that did like thirty thousand hats or oh, something Lord. in like six months. Six. So, oh. And you're talking about like, yeah, in in six months. You're talking about like two, three hundred per per. Was day that their only client so. or what? Yeah. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, I mean that's like that's like they they I think they um they are in like a pe like people outsource their embroidery to, to them so they just kind of like f fulfill the orders oh. so like people um from different companies or like pro promo companies then they want some some apparel they just outsource to them and because they have a large uh multi-head machine um not only just like multi-needle but like multi-heads i think it's like six, six heads so they can run like hundreds of hats on a daily basis and they've gotten that volume to, to justify that but um you know the, the the smaller orders with like more personalization and these kind of like really um one-of-a-kind people Pieces, yeah, they're they're not in that segment of the business, but I know plenty of customers that focus on kind of the DIY mm -hmm. stuff, and they're very active on Etsy and getting their name out there and creating these very um, you know handmade goods, right? Mm -hmm. That handmade movement that that you were talking about. Um, they're they're like a big uh, big advocate of, of of all of that. You know, and you know what the funny thing is, people are almost more impressed with embroidery than they are with like some sewing projects, even though the sewing projects mm -hmm. take like more work. People just uh -huh. look at the embroidery and they're like kind of amazed by it. Like even though a computer mm. does, like I just have to push a button, so it's really not that complicated for me. But people right, look at it right. and they can't believe you did it. Like they're like, you put my initials on a pillowcase? So I think as far yeah. as the gifting goes, <laughs> like people are really blown away by it. And even though it's not, you know, I don't know, so that's a good thing. They think it's a lot more a lot more difficult than it really is. Yeah, and I think it's the wow factor of having it's like wow, you put my my monograms on the on the gift, right? Like that they, they think it's 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 something <laughs> magical, but really it's just like with the right yeah. technology and the right tools and the right knowledge, um, anyone can 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 do that. But I think um, that's why embroidery kind of has that like wow wow factor that um, I've seen people at some of our trade shows that just stare at the machine. <laughs> they're like they're like mesmerized by by how the machines uh, you know is able to embroider these complex logos um, they just stare at it for for hours and then they just like they, they can't wait to get the sample when it's done off of our machine and we and we and we give them away to the crowd they, they're like waiting there to get the sample because they're so you know mesmerized by how the machine works so um, I think with with how technology has has uh, come in all in all these years uh, it's made it's made it more uh, it's, it's made it a lot more easier for for people to get access um, to to these type of products to be able to have the right tools and make it happen right yeah. so even with with sewing machines even with the DIY people there's a that, that, that huge movement there is because the um, the equipment the technology uh, is is more uh, readily available to the masses and and now it's like it opens the doors for a lot more possible yeah and I would say too to any beginner to sewing or embroidery or even quilting the sewing machines and the technology out there is just getting better and better so I feel like there's never been a better time to start because it's the ease of starting is is pretty, it, I feel like it's pretty low to the average person because the machines can do so much now. Like they, they cut thread, they do all kinds of stuff. Can, can you imagine like thousands of years ago or even hundreds of years ago, like people used to do this by hand. Oh my gosh. Like you would sew and, 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 and embroider by, by hand. And But you know, embroidery isn't something new. It's like, it was available like thousands of years ago, but people do that by, by hand. And now what used to take you like a, a whole month for a complex design now takes you only hours, right? So um, the it's amazing how technology has, has come along to be able to have the masses be able to kind of um, one, to, to, to be able to afford some, some, something of that scale and to be able to have the possibility of making something like that that complex happen. Yeah, and I've even noticed hand embroidery is really having a comeback as well. So I, I'm excited yeah. to see embroidery period that's, you know, kind of getting its time in the sun. And, and I think that's awesome. I think it's neat to see people doing things like that. And I do think that someone who start off, starts off with like needlework or embroidery, 
I think they're the perfect audience to segue into machines. Do you, uh, now, uh, speaking of some of the the, the projects that um, you've you've worked on, do you do you feel the, uh, the the need or the urge that every time you're working on a project, you kind of turn on the camera and, and record the record the process to share with your audience? Yeah, actually, and that's uh, it's it's funny because some things you would think are kind of boring. So you're like, maybe I shouldn't record, you know, maybe I shouldn't tape this. Um, but those often are the videos that do the best. Um, so I do, as okay. I'm doing each project, um, I, and here's the other thing, a lot of people are doing tutorials on YouTube, but I yeah. think with some certain projects, I think a lot of the people watching don't really necessarily want a tutorial. They just want to watch somebody doing something cool. So I, yeah. I feel like a lot of the videos I've done aren't really full out tutorials, but it's more of a documentation because I feel like a lot of the video, the how to videos, 99% of the people watching them aren't actually going to ever make the project. So at a yeah. certain point, I kind of changed my thinking to instead of meticulously documenting every step of this, maybe I just show what I did because I, I, okay. I know that people aren't really going to make this item necessarily, but they still will appreciate it. And then you can get kind of a non-sewing audience as well who just want to watch something entertaining. Gotcha. And then, so how, how do you, so is that how you kind of determine the, the, the different topics to cover on, on your channel? And what have you found the most, um, I guess you, you, you mentioned some of that, like the, the things just that are, that are cool, but how, how do you kind of extract what's cool and what's trending and turn that into something for your audience? You know, my ideas kind of, I keep a list of running ideas I have on a board. So okay. like these are the videos I'd like to do. And there are a lot of different types of YouTube videos. You can do, um, help videos, which would be more of a how-to. You can do hub videos, which would be kind of like what you're doing with this podcast, something for the audience and it's very like community related. The other types of videos are hero videos and hero videos, uh, you know, might be this shoe butter butterfly project, mm. something that has the yeah. potential to go viral and has a lot of visual impact and a good story to it. The yeah. most successful channels are the ones where the creators are true to themselves in creating content that they're really passionate about and really enjoy doing. So if you're making videos just to make videos, but you hate them, you know, they're probably not gonna do that well. You really need to do videos that you think have value to the audience, but also videos that you really love making. Um, so I, wa I wanna try to make videos that I, like if I'm not enjoying it, that's probably not a good sign. Right, right, right. And speaking of some of the kind of projects that, that you're planning on, um, but uh, talking more in, into the mm -hmm. into the future, where do you see your channel or kind of like this whole thing going in like three to five years? You know, I, I'm not really sure at this point. I've actually been trying to figure that out myself. I, okay. I love creating videos, especially with the background in TV. I think it's a really good mix for me because I'm, yeah. the thing about working in news is that a lot of people after you've been in the business for a while, you get really burned out and you're doing stories about stuff that's kind of monotonous. Like I know, I know it's kind of hard to say crime is monotonous, but after a while, all of these stories tend to blur together. And also it's not as creative as a field as you would think. The, the packaging in the news format is kind of formulaic. You're really not allowed to do the kind of stories you, you want all the time. That's pretty rare to find. So I think that's the thing about YouTube that I really like is that there's no, there's no like traditional infrastructure. You, like you just okay. go straight to the audience. So there's no filter and you can, you can really talk to people one-on-one -on -one and you don't have to have like TV executives approving all of your ideas. Love it. Um, I think to uh, kind of wrap things up, you know, I think a, a good segue into uh, kind of our last question here is um, what advice would you give to uh, not only, you know, the younger generation who want, who we want to get more exposed to this world, uh, but also just, you know, uh, people or, on, or entrepreneurs in, in general um, that wants to kind of, um, you know, either learn more about this space or, or, or kind of learn, learn a new skill. Um, what, what, are, what are some advice uh, that you would give them from your past experience that can help them get kickstarted so that they don't make the same, the same, the same mistakes that, um, that others have made before? That's actually an excellent question. I've certainly made a lot of mistakes along the way. I think one of the biggest mistakes I made in my younger years was I wasted a lot of my 20s doing stuff that really didn't matter. I was the one watching, you know, spending hours watching DVDs from Blockbuster. Yes, Blockbuster. I spent tons of time hanging out with friends, 
And there is nothing inherently wrong with any of that, but I could have been doing so much more than that. And I feel like I really kind of busted a lot of that potential. I think another thing I could have done, a good family friend of mine was a very talented seamstress and she owned a bridal shop. And knowing what I do now, I so wish I would have appreciated what she had done and learned from her. I think one of the biggest mistakes young people have is they don't, I, this is just something I've noticed, they don't have enough interest in people with more life experience. If there's someone around you, a neighbor, a friend, you know, a family member who has more life experience than you in a certain area, you need to take every opportunity you can to learn what they know because they know more than you. And I think that's something as a, as a younger woman, I just really didn't understand. And I do feel like I, I let a lot of those uh, opportunities to get to know people better or learn from them, I, I let them slip away. Like that woman, the family friend, she's passed away. But imagine how much better of a seamstress I could have been if I'd taken the time to like go to her shop or try to have her teach me things but I just didn't have an appreciation for it at the time. And that's actually a really huge regret I have in my life. Um, another thing is um, don't listen to people whose opinions don't mean anything. Like whenever I, you know, I don't really go, especially not on like Facebook, I don't solicit opinions or feedback from a lot of people in my social circles. I like them as people, but especially like for things like YouTube, they don't know anything about YouTube, so why would I get YouTube advice from people who don't do YouTube and don't know anything about it and don't even watch YouTube? So that's enough. And also, I don't really get a lot of YouTube advice from TV people because the things you learn in TV are just really different than YouTube. So if you are trying to get advice from someone, you really need to seek out people who actually have expertise and, and authority in that area. Don't just go to your random friends because they're going to give you really bad advice. So that's, an, that's another one. Um, I think also like just looking, look for people to connect with who, who you might be able to have a mutually beneficial relationship. And also when you reach out to them, like I've had a lot of people reach out to me for the channel to ask sewing questions or like, a, your, or like Laura reached out to me. Um, and a lot of the people that reach out to me or even on LinkedIn for professional reasons when I was working in news, but I feel like a lot of the people that reach out to someone professionally or for personal reasons, they go, they, it's all about them. Like they'll send you an email, but they don't offer you any value. It's all about what you can do for them. And I would, my advice for you, if you're out there and you want to connect with other people, when you're contacting those people and you want when you want to interact, you need to make sure you're making it clear what value you can bring to them because they're going to be a lot more likely to respond to you in a positive way if they see that it can be more of a mutual beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship and not a one-way street. I, I've seen a lot of people do that, you know, like I literally would have people kind of, I didn't really know when I was at CNN being like, hey, can you get me a job at CNN? I didn't know the person, you know, I, and again, I, I didn't know what kind of person they were. So how would I recommend them for a job if I, if I didn't know they were like a solid candidate for a position? So if you are reaching out to someone for various reasons, um, really think about your first encounter with them and make sure when you're reaching out, you really make it very clear what you can do for them because I think a lot of people tend to be kind of self-absorbed or just kind of looking to get something, but you also have to be looking to give. Yeah, no, I think that you're right on point with that. Give before yeah. you ask, right? That's, oh, for sure. That's something that <laughs> I think is like social interaction uh, 101 especially in, 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 t in today's world, it's like, you know, you have to give before you ask. And, um, and, and your point to kind of, you know, not listening to uh, people's advice that, that doesn't matter, I think, you know, overall, um, people that, that are um, not taking action, they're just, mm -hmm. they're just afraid or, yeah. or scared of what other people are, are, are going to say or like, oh, how other people would, would view them. Um, and in reality, it's like, who, who cares? Yeah, who cares right? about your like, opinion? Why, why, yeah, it's like, you know, if um, it, does, it, it shouldn't matter. Someone else's opinion shouldn't matter uh, in what you decide to do and, and, and how you decide to take your career to the, to, the, to the next level. So I think those last two points definitely resonate a lot with, uh, with, with me. And um, 
uh, it's definitely something that uh, I, I hope that our viewers will, will, will take to heart because it is something that uh, it's very common that you know people people don't take that next step because they're 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 afraid of not not it, not because of like um, some external factor but it's like it's they're afraid of the, of like what they're able to do and what other people are gonna think of them because they they, they might fail but like in reality um, if you just get started uh, you are you are you are already one step ahead of most most people yeah because right? like if most people are like in that in that zone where they're not gonna take action and you're in and you're the one that does um, you're already one step ahead of those people without doing anything more so um, I think just taking that first step and, and giving before you you ask is something that um, you know a, a lot of people should keep in mind yeah for sure and and it's one of those things where I think a lot of people they they solicit too much feedback from the people around them and then they're never able to make a decision because they're just six, oh, yeah. like they're just bombarded with too many opinions and then you're like well and then you tend to second guess yourself so instead of second guessing yourself just make the decision just pull the trigger and, and yeah and just it. do it without worrying about yeah. feedback from your family and friends because unless that person has expertise in what you want to do i wouldn't ask them their opinion right and in even getting it just out there just getting your product or getting your idea out there and taking that first step um, you are much better off than not doing yeah. it and then getting all this feedback and you're just like in a closed room trying to think, oh, how can I make this better? How can I make that better? And you never end up doing it anyway. Yeah, because you're so busy trying to figure out how to make it perfect that, you, that it just never happens. Exactly, and I and I've seen so many people people do that, and I think it's it's uh, it's great um, that that it, it's coming from you and saying that yeah, you should just really t uh, take that take that step. Don't care about what other no. people are saying, but uh, taking that first step, you're going to be much much better off than those who are not taking action. So um, even if it's not a per it's it's not perfect right off the bat, it's something that you can figure out, and you're already one step ahead and one step closer to reaching your goal than someone who's just going to sit there and listen to all these opinions and try to f try to figure things out without getting your ideas out there yeah and actually my stepdad uh, some good business advice he gave me was he said if you want to do anything don't think you have to have it all figured out when you when you make that decision so if you're mm -hmm. if you're you know if you're gonna take the next step or do something don't feel like you have to have all the answers make the commitment and then along the way you you will figure it out because you'll be forced to. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, it's it's, it's been awesome, uh, um, you know, hearing your your experience and your uh, projects that you've been working on and kind of your uh, f your future goals and uh, future onset for what your channel is going to become. Um, definitely uh, very interesting for our audience and for and for, for myself to learn about your experience and how you transition from TV to now running a YouTube channel full time. Definitely wish you the the, the best of luck and uh, looking forward. To to stay in touch and having more um, more episodes li like this, where we can you know talk about a, a particular topic uh, that's suitable for our, for our, for both of our audiences. Thank you so much. This has been a, a, just a, a pleasure talking with you, Henry. Well, Jennifer, it's been nice having you, and we'll see you next time. All right, see you later, Henry. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode with Jennifer Moore and learn about her experience in the past with CNN and what she's doing now and her plans for her channel in the future. Now, if you want to check out more of her content, make sure to go to her channel, which I have linked in the description below. Also, if you like episodes like this, make sure to smash that subscribe button so you, you keep up to date with the latest content and make sure to join our free Facebook group, Embroidery and Custom Apparel Mastery, if you haven't done so already. I've also linked that in the description below. In there, you can join thousands of other embroiderers and custom apparel decorators to learn the craft, ask questions, and engage in the community of like-minded people. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you guys in the next episode.